to remember the 69th anniversary of the two bombs that took over 200,000 lives, there is something we can do besides remember, remember and witness. This coming year is a renewal for the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's one of the most important treaties of our time, and Dr. Helfen will reiterate this point, uh, and perhaps for, for all of humanity. Uh, it's the agreement between nuclear nations that they must give up these weapons of mass destruction and that they um, must um, move towards greater peace. Uh, the populations of the nations, these nuclear nations, must pressure their governments to adhere to and enforce the NPT. And that too is something that we can do as the second, uh, the country with the second largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. In Western Mass, uh, ANC will be working for the next year, for about the next nine months until the spring of 2015, uh, on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We're going to be working on getting people on buses for the huge march from Times Square to the UN, um, and we'll be working to put pressure on our senators to make sure that the NPT uh, is enforced, our senators and our president. Um, we need your help. This coming year is a renewal for the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's one of the most important treaties of our time, and Dr. Helfen will reiterate this point. Uh, Seeing his accolades right now. Uh, great timing. So, uh, Dr. Helfen <laughs> is a past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, and has been to Oslo on behalf of the organization's position as a Nobel Peace Prize winner. I don't mean to sound competitive, but AFSC and Physicians for Social Responsibility are now both tied for one Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Dr. Helfen is also the current co-president of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and we are fortunate enough to have him as a doctor and a resident here in Northampton, and I'm pleased to introduce him. From my perspective, there are two aspects of Hiroshima and Nagasaki commemorative events. One, obviously, is to commemorate what happened there and to, to honor the hundreds of thousands of people who died in those two tragedies. But I think even more important, we need to use these anniversaries each year uh, as a way of reminding the world that what happened there can, in fact, will happen again if we don't take action to keep that from happening. This is, has been a technique that uh, has been used to help people understand exactly what Ira has been talking about. And I want you to listen very carefully, shut your eyes as I drop one BB into the can to help you understand one BB represents all the fire, fire power, all the megatonnage that was used in World War II uh, including the bombing of Dresden, uh, London, Tokyo. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were two very small nuclear weapons, too. There are in the world today about 15,000 nuclear weapons. Most of them anywhere from 10 to 30 times larger than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, if you shut your eyes, I'm going to demonstrate to you what uh, the kind of megatonnage now on the Poseidon submarines. And we have learned in recent years that the use of even a very small fraction of these arsenals, as few as 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs, would cause worldwide climate disruption that would uh, devastate food production around the world and lead to a nuclear famine that could kill up to 2 billion people. Uh, that's a small percentage of the arsenal. It's less than 0.03% of the nuclear firepower in the world's arsenals today. And this one represents all of the megatonnage that is now on the Trident submarines. States and Russia uh, would be far more destructive 
Um, a study that we did back in 2002 showed that if only 300 of the 8,000 nuclear weapons that the Russians have got through to targets in, in cities here in the United States, something like 75 to 100 million people would die in the first half hour. In addition, the entire economic infrastructure of the country would be destroyed. Everything that we depend on to maintain ourselves, the public health system, the, the banking system, the food distribution system, the communications network, it would all be gone. And in the aftermath of that attack, it is probable that the vast majority of the American people would die uh, from starvation, from exposure to cold, uh, from radiation poisoning, from epidemic disease. And the U.S. counterattack on Russia would cause the same level of destruction there. And if NATO got drawn into the conflict, the same level of destruction would occur across most of Europe and Canada. Um, but as really, uh, literally unimaginable as these direct consequences of a war between the U.S. and Russia would be, uh, this is not the worst part of the story because here too, it, it's the climate impact that really is to, you know, tells the story. A war involving 100 small Hiroshima-sized bombs drops global temperatures about 1.3 degrees centigrade. A large war between the U.S. and Russia involving just the weapons that will still be left in 2017 when New START is fully implemented. That war puts about 150 million tons of soot into the upper atmosphere, and it drops global temperatures an average of 8 degrees centigrade. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperatures fall about 20 to 30 degrees centigrade. We have not seen temperatures on this planet that cold in 18,000 years since the coldest moment of the last ice age. In the Northern Hemisphere, there would be three years without a single day free of frost following this kind of war between the US and Russia. That means the temperature would go below 32 degrees at least some portion of every single day there would be a frost. And that means that no food would be produced. Ecosystems would collapse. Many, many species would become extinct. The vast majority of the human race would starve to death and it is possible that our species will become extinct. And this represents the megatonic that we have now available to use by all of the nuclear nations. Today, 
you get the sense that we are watching our own guns of August. Uh, they describe a situation in eastern Ukraine where uh, the Ukrainian government, in its attempt to re-secure the parts of the country that have been seized by Russian separatists, uh, really don't have full control over what's going on. There are Ukrainian militias that are not directly tied to the government that are operating in the area. Uh, there are Russian-backed militias that are fighting there. And the possibility of this escalating into a war between Ukraine and Russia, a major land war in Europe, now, 30 years after the end of the Cold War, this is a real possibility. And if that happens, it is very quite possible that the US and NATO will get drawn into that conflict. The assurances of, of the State Department last September that we don't need to worry about war between the US and Russia ring spectacularly hollow given the events take unfolding in the world today. There's a very real danger there will be war. And there's therefore a very real imperative that we make sure that such a conflict not take place with nuclear weapons. Uh, even if we don't actually stumble into an intentional war, there is always the possibility of an accidental conflict. We know of at least five occasions since 1979 when either Moscow or Washington prepared to launch a nuclear war in the mistaken belief that it, was, it itself was already under attack from the other side. The most recent of these episodes that we know about, and there are probably others that haven't made it into the public domain, but the most recent that we know about was in January of 1995, which was a full five years after the Cold War. And as many of you may know, on that morning, the United States launched a rocket from Norway to study atmospheric phenomena. We informed the Russians. Somebody in Moscow forgot to pass word on to the appropriate people. And when Russian military radar picked up this rocket, uh, they initially interpreted this as the first wave of a US surprise attack on Moscow. Uh, for the only time we know about during the entire nuclear weapons era, the briefcase carried by the Russian leadership to respond to nuclear war was activated. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia, was wakened and told that he had five minutes to decide what to do. What he should have done was to start World War III. Both the United States and Russia, then and to now, operate under a doctrine called launch on warning. That holds that if they believe they are under attack by nuclear weapons, they are supposed to launch their retaliation immediately and not wait for the incoming missiles to destroy their military capabilities. We don't know what happened in the Kremlin that morning. Uh, Boris Yeltsin was a very sick man. He was an alcoholic. He was incapacitated for days at a time by his drinking. Uh, it, it is literally possible that he was simply too drunk to be wakened that morning. And that's why there was not a war. All we know is that, for some reason, the Russians did not follow their military doctrine. They did not launch a retaliatory strike, and the danger passed. Now, January 25th, 1995, the day when this took place, was a perfectly normal day. There was no crisis any place in the world that should have led to conflict between the United States and Russia. And we came within minutes of blowing up the entire planet. The conditions which existed then, the presence of thousands of nuclear warheads mounted on missiles on air trigger alert that could be launched in just 15 minutes and destroy the world 30 minutes later, those conditions have not changed one bit since then. What has changed is the world has become a much more dangerous place. Relations between the US and Russia are difficult now. Uh, India and Pakistan have tested nuclear weapons and have uh, an ongoing uh, conflict across their shared border in Kashmir. The North Koreans have developed nuclear weapons. The Iranians are probably trying to develop nuclear weapons. There's all kinds of fighting in the Middle East. It is a much more dangerous world that we're living in. The weapons are primed and ready to go, and we're not doing anything about it. Well, I shouldn't say that exactly, because the good news is that over the last several years, a very important movement has developed to work for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm not quite sure why things suddenly came together, why the stars aligned the right way. Uh, part of it, I think, was the publication of the new research on the limited nuclear war, showing that just a very small war would be a global uh, disaster. Part of it was the decision of the International Red Cross to play a very active role on this issue. Um, but whatever the, the reasons, 
uh, a number of countries have decided that they need to push the nuclear weapon states to honor their obligations under Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and actually negotiate a nuclear weapons convention that will eliminate the nuclear arsenals of the world. They began with a meeting in Oslo in March of 2013 that was attended by 126 countries. A two-day meeting on the medical consequences of nuclear war, the message that my organization has been trying to promote for the last 30 years. Uh, there's never been anything like this before. This was followed up in February of this year by a second meeting in Nayarit, Mexico, attended by 146 countries, three quarters of the nations of the earth. It was not attended by the United States, which actively boycotted this meeting along with Russia, China, the UK, and France, the all five programs of the Security Council, the countries which are allowed to temporarily maintain nuclear weapons under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The reason that they boycotted this meeting, I think, is quite clear. They're concerned that this process will, like the other process that led to the Landmine Treaty, lead to a treaty that bans nuclear weapons. And for reasons which I don't fully understand, all of these governments, including the US, have opposed this. Um, the meeting I had with Rose Gottmuller was to talk to her about this and to express, really, the difficulty we were all having understanding the US position. This administration claims that it seeks a world free of nuclear weapons. It claims also that the reason we're not making progress is because of uh, opposition to this from the Russians, which I think is true, and from the Republicans in our, in our Congress, which is also true. But if this is the case, if they want to get rid of nuclear weapons, and they need to overcome opposition from the Russians and the Republicans, they should welcome this initiative, which is designed to build worldwide pressure on everybody who has nuclear weapons to get rid of them. We've just heard in the last few weeks from colleagues in Norway that the US government appears to be changing its position. Apparently, on at least two occasions in the last month, high-ranking State Department officials told members of the Norwegian uh, government that they now, the US now views with favor um, this process and is particularly pleased with the work of Austria and Norway. Uh, they have not yet committed to going to the meeting in Vienna in December. Um, but I think there's a real chance that we can get them to go. And I think that needs to be a real focus of all of our activity in the coming months. Contacting the White House and letting them know that there is a large and growing consensus of people who feel that the US needs to join this process and provide leadership to it. The US has done a lot of bad things. Um, it also has done, on a number of occasions, some really great things. And it has an opportunity in this situation to provide critical leadership to the world towards the most important problem that the world faces today. And I say this to this audience without needing really to explain myself in great detail. There are lots of problems in the world that consume the interests and attention of many people. But I think we all understand that if we do not deal with the nuclear issue, the other problems really aren't going to matter because we're not going to be here to deal with them. When talking to audiences about this, there's obviously a certain heaviness about it all. Uh, this is not an easy subject to talk about or to listen to. But I think at this moment, there's reason for us to have great hope. We are in a position to really make a significant advance towards the goal of abolishing nuclear weapons. And it is terribly important that we seize this moment. There's a tremendous responsibility on all of us who understand the danger that we face. Once you know that something, that there's a danger out there, you have to do something about it. And this responsibility sits on our shoulders and it will continue to sit on our shoulders until we're successful in getting rid of these weapons. But that responsibility, I think, is also, in many ways, a very great gift. Uh, every one of us wants to do something good with our lives. We've been given the opportunity to save the entire world. And that is a very good thing to do. And I think we should look at the current situation in that way. We have the opportunity to create a world free of nuclear weapons where our children and their children and their children after them will have the opportunity to deal with all the other problems the world faces, to live their lives, and to build a better world. And this challenge, which sits before us tonight, is one which I hope we will all find the courage and strength to take up with great energy and pursue, especially in the coming months, 
because there's a real, real opportunity to make progress here. Thank you very much. The film that we're about to see is called America's Secret Fukushima. It's actually called America's Secret Chernobyl. Uh, it is a very short 15 minute clip about the uh, current state of uranium mines in the United States. You might have recognized a number of our friends there. Uh, Tim Bullock was in this film, and uh, Tarek Koff. Uh, Jill Stein was in it, as well as Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zeese. Um, Charmaine Whiteface was one of the, the people who many of us recognized because she was on the walk, and, uh, and she has been really the spearhead, the person really, uh, she is Charmaine at Defenders of the Black Hills. And um, my friend Crystal Zivon was supposed to go with them. She was on this trip, and she was supposed to go with them a few weeks ago to lobby in Washington. And because she had a, a knee surgery, I agreed to take her place. Um, as many of you know, many of us don't have a lot of faith in lobbying, but, um, but it was a wonderful experience to, uh, to be with these folks. And uh, Raul Grijalva, who is a congressperson from Tucson, Arizona, has agreed to be the lead sponsor. And we had a meeting with our own Jim McGovern, who uh, agreed to be a co-sponsor and was the only congressperson who actually sat down with us and chatted and uh, talk not only about the uranium mines, but about other topics that are of concern to all of us. Let me just give you a few specifics about this bill. Um, the, the, major, the major items in the bill are an inventory of mines. I have some literature from the Clean Up the Mines that says there are 10,000 mines, you hear there are 2,000, you hear there are 42,000. And, uh, and then there are mines in different parts of, of the Southwest and even in the East. So what, one of the things that, that we're asking for in the bill is to do an inventory. The second is a moratorium on new mines. And that's something that, that Charmaine does not want to negotiate. But, um, but with this, uh, this fear-mongering that's going on that, um, that Ira Helfan talked about, the, uh, the possibility of escalating our own nuclear warheads, there'll be a greater demand for uranium. But, but it's something that, that Charmaine is standing firm on, that she doesn't want to, to negotiate that. And the other big piece is bioremediation that really speaks to those of us who have been working on the, uh, what's going to happen with the, the rods at Vermont Yankee. It's the same thing. So far, the bioremediation, so-called, that's taking place is nothing more than cosmetic. People will come in, throw new uh, soil on top of the old mines, and, and nothing has really changed. So, so those are the three big issues. The other is having a meaningful oversight. Um, the two, the two um, departments in the Congress that are related to this are our own friendly Nuclear Regulatory Commission that nobody has any faith in, and uh, who said that? And, uh, and the other is the um, Environmental Protection Agency. Now one of the things that, that we talked about, and it's actually the Environmental Protection Agency is better than the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but that's debatable too. The question, one of the uh, one of the aides, we, we did a lot of visiting with um, with different members of Congress staff, and uh, Rahul, as I said, is right behind it, and he's he's got a lot of friends in Congress and is highly respected. The big question is, when will Congress ever get around to uh, to writing this bill? When will the legislative aides do the do the bill? write the bill, and when will they ever get around to, to discussing it, even in committee? Because we know they're now on recess, and then in November, because it's a big midterm election, everybody will be out campaigning, and there, there'll be all this jockeying. So 
who knows when, if, if this bill will even come up this Congress. However, the good news is things may change in this Congress between now and January, and uh, it's a new Congress. So, um, so this, this talk, this bill, uh, will not die because there are too many people all over the country who are learning about this. Now, I'll just tell you two, two things that, that really struck me. One was, if you have anybody, you know, first of all, we, we all know what's happened in Fukushima. Is there anybody who hasn't heard of Fukushima? You know, because it really makes the news. But our own secret Fukushima doesn't make the news. And mostly because, as was noted in the film, it's on native land and it's on government land. But there are two very important other places. One is Mount Rushmore. And people who are visiting Sioux City, Sioux City, the, the place you stay when you're going to visit Mount Rushmore, now has signs in the, in the motels and hotels, do not drink the water. Now they don't say don't breathe the air. And when the, uh, when the, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce was, was approached about this, when, when business was approached, uh, the Chamber of Commerce said, we can't let this out because it will destroy our economy. And nobody would go to Mount Rushmore. <coughs> and the other thing that, that my, my friends I was lobbying with shared with us was that the Little Colorado River is one of the rivers that, uh, that has a lot of, of radiation in it. And that, of course, flows into the Colorado. So between the Little Colorado River and places along the Grand Canyon in which there have been um, uranium mines are, are seeping and leaking. So that if you're touring or visiting the, uh, the Grand Canyon, one of our most beautiful natural resources, you are at risk. So these are really important issues and, uh, and there will be a bill and we'll encourage you to, first of all, if you encounter during this recess, if you encounter our wonderful uh, US representative, you can thank him for this, while we talk to him about other things. And, uh, and you can also just stay tuned to, uh, to what's happening and to talk with your friends in other parts of the country who, uh, who have legislators who will be speaking to these issues. So, um, clean up the uranium mines is their slogan. P.S. Charmaine Whiteface was not with us. She was supposed to be, but she isn't well. So um, keep her in your hearts, too. Thanks. And now Vanessa is going to speak about the walk that she and members of the Peace Pagoda have been on. The time has come for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. Now I have chosen today to preach about the war in Vietnam because I agree with Dante, that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. These words were spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his Beyond Vietnam speech. This speech was written by Dr. Vincent Harding who passed away this May. And as we walked we carried with us a message from Vincent Harding, a message that went something like, we are members of a society that does not yet exist, but that we will bring into existence by organizing goodness. So we carried that with on, us on the walk, this thought of organizing goodness. Last uh, Wednesday, July 30th, we began our 10-day walk across Massachusetts. Um, today marks uh, 69 years since the first atomic bombs were dropped on this planet. And every year the New England Peace Pagoda does a walk to commemorate the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which when they exploded instantly killed tens of thousands of people. This year as we walked we had three kind of major focuses. One being commemorating the lives lost in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Two, uh, calling for peace uh, and an end to the bombing of Gaza. And three, supporting the refugee children, the 60,000 children who are at the U.S. border right now waiting for housing. Um, 
So our governor, Deval Patrick, said that Massachusetts would welcome 1,000 of these children into the state. And we were very moved by this statement that he made on July 18th. So we wrote up a short statement thanking, Dr. thanking Governor Patrick uh, for his humanitarian effort and his compassion. And we carried this with us um, as we walked from the Leverett Peace Pagoda, the New England Peace Pagoda, across the state into Boston. Um, so the way that the walk kind of works is each day we walk an average of 10 miles and then each night we have a short discussion um, and potluck dinner with whatever community that we're in. Um, and this walk we had a, a really heavy focus um, on youth, on young people, um, and really wanted to connect with as many young people as possible. So uh, we started off in Leverett, um, we walked through um, starting at uh, Plainfield at Earth Dance um, and met youth who were there from all over the state. Um, the Institute, the International Musical Academy. Uh, in Springfield, we worked with the Injustice Liberation Front, a committee out of Arise for Social Justice. We worked with youth from Out Now. We walked with youth from um, organizers with Springfield, No One Leaves. Um, along this walk, we held um, rallies. We came last Friday to the rally to call for an end to the bombing of Gaza. We um, had a vigil and rally and Know Your Rights training in front of the Springfield Police Station um, last Saturday and have really just been connecting with communities as we go um, and trying to engage in conversations about peace, um, about peace and community building and nonviolence. Um, and, and one thing, you know, we, when, we carry these, when we carry these issues, when we're dealing with the racism, the war, the poverty, when we're dealing with radiation that's going to stay radioactive for tens of thousands of years, um, uranium mining that's poisoning our water, um, it can seem really overwhelming um, and it can, uh, it can be, it can be heavy um, and walking is a chance to really come together and share those stories um, and find a way to heal from that pain, from the external pain of war, um, but from the internal kind of threat of violence and how to come together as communities. And one thing that always strikes me on the walk is I think there's these overwhelming ideas and stereotypes that people are inherently violent um, or racist or sexist or just terrible, terrible people. Um, but when we walk, we find something like the opposite is true. And we get lots of like honks and waves and um, people come to our community dinners just with a lot of questions. Not to kind of sugarcoat it, there are some very angry people in the world. Um, but overwhelmingly, I think people are looking for a space to come together and a space to build and a space to talk. And for me, that's part of what the walk was. Um, so today marks the end of our 10-day march through the state. Um, and um, there's a, only two of us from the walk here, but we're representing a much larger crowd um, from people all across the state. Um, and just... Uh, yeah, as we remember and hold in our hearts the, the people who died at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the people who 65 years later had to deal with another nuclear catastrophe, um, with Charmaine Whiteface, uh, with the people in the Great Sioux Nation, um, we also have to remember that despite all of that, we are still here, and we are still surviving, and we are still resisting, and we are still in community. So though we're carrying kind of their pain in our hearts, we also have to kind of celebrate that we're still here. The movement is still here. Uh, so thank you. But right now we're going to hear from Dr. Pat Hines. The poet and survivor of the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima, Sankichi Toje, wrote this poem entitled, Give Back the Human. It is inscribed on a memorial stone in the Hiroshima Peace Park. Give back my father. Give back my mother. Give grandpa, grandma back. Give my sons and daughter back. Give me back myself. Give back the human race. As long as this life lasts, this life, give back peace. Peace that will never end. As we commemorate the victims, dead and living, of the U.S. dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, let us also remember the nuclear refugees of Fukushima and also stand with the Japanese people who support their peace constitutions 
while their national government works to erode it and to remilitarize the country.